Everybody doing all right this Sunday morning? Yes. All right. Um, you know, we're uh, moving into a new adventure. Um, we've kind of going to just jump right in and, and talk about some things that really um, have been developing in um, my journey, in my faith, and in my leadership um, over the last 20 years. Um, so we're starting this series this morning that is, uh, we're calling it The Communal Life. Um, we're going to kind of take a look at some of the marks of a biblical community, some of the things that I think the scriptures um, tend to highlight for us in a variety of ways of, of what it looks like to do life deeply together. Um, and so this morning we're going to be talking about um, knowing. Um, as we do that, and we're going to lay the context for this conversation with the scripture that comes out of Acts. Um, it is Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, it is probably um, just a tidbit trivia that you may or may not want to know. It is my absolute favorite passage of scripture in the entire Old and New Testament text. Pay attention. <laughs> You'll notice that my personal email is Acts 242, and they all are either at Hotmail, Gmail, or whatever. Um, this is something that I believe is truly foundational, and, and I hope that maybe we get a glimpse of why as we talk about it this morning. I invite you now to listen to the Word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Uh, I'm going to do it because I'm weird, and y'all know I'm weird. So this is the word of God for the people of God, and the people of God say, thanks be to God. We got Methodist in the building. <laughs> I love this text. But for y'all to understand where I'm going to go with it, you have to understand, I think, just a little bit about how I put the pieces together. Um, so we've got to start all the way back. I hope y'all have got lots of time this morning. We're going to start all the way back in Genesis. Y'all ready? Um, I won't belabor this too much, but I take seriously the way that the Scripture talks to us about the communion of God, the community of God. And I take seriously those, those places in Genesis where it, God gives us information through God's word that says, um, let us, there's a plurality of God, a communal nature of God, let us create them, ish and isha, ha adam, ha adama, let us create them in our image. Right from the very get-go, early in the holy text, we're told that there is a communal nature, not just in the way that we're created, but in the way that we are related to God and to one another. And, and without that foundational understanding, this, this text may fall a little flat that we're looking at in the book of Acts this morning. Um, I, I believe that this, this passage is really calling us to a place of knowing. There is something that is important in communal life about knowing one another and being known. And I think that this knowing happens kind of in four ways, and that's what I want to try to unpack with you that I see in the, the piece that we have out of Acts. Um, the first thing, and, and I think that any church that is actually living as a church, and hear me, I think we are, I believe we are, I see that we are, this is not a critique that we are not, but I believe that any church that is living into the scriptures and, and is doing what we're called to do, following the great commandments and the great commission um, and all that the text invites us to do, uh, we are charged with moving into a deeper knowing of God. Now, this group of ragtag individuals, these Christ followers who were in the first century and are trying to discern their way forward, um, this is really, you know, the beginnings of how the early church lived. They met together regularly. 
there is something about that meeting that is important. It is, um, Soren Kierkegaard said, you cannot be an anonymous Christian. And friends, if you look at the Barner reports and all of the religious studies that are out there, the sociological studies where most of us in the country say that we are Christian, but uh, like 85 to 92 percent, depending on which study you're reading, will say that we have faith, we have faith in Jesus, that will, you know, that there's this great opportunity that we believe in God, but we don't show up in worship. We don't invest in one another in small groups, that there's really this individualistic nature, this almost consumeristic nature that society is wanting to shape our faith into. And, and the text speaks into that and speaks against it. You see, there is a communal nature. I need you and you need each other and we all need one another. Um, as iron sharpens iron, our faith is worked out in these relationships that we have together. So spending time together is, is hugely important. This idea that we would get to know one another and, and that we would break bread. And so like it's not all um, let's just hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Anybody remember that song? <laughs> Am I dating myself now? <laughs> okay, that's all right. Um, it, it's, it's a different kind of presence together. It, it's all of God and all of God's life that God gives us. And all of our lives is sacred. There, there's not a distinction between the sacred and the secular, at least there hopefully won't be in the future. So there's this gathering, and, and the gathering's important. I'm going to come back to those personal relationships. But, but one of the most important things that we see in this text when they gather together is that they were studying the doctrine of God in their meetings. Yeah? You remember hearing the text? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Hmm. They were intentional about knowing God. The apostles' teaching, the doctrine of the church, is it starting to be birthed and hammered out? And it would be centuries before some of the councils would actually settle on some understandings of what it meant to be a Christ follower. But they were hammering this thing out together. They were getting together and understanding that the apostles were teaching them that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. It is the very earliest creed of the, of the church that they were learning that this is the character and nature of God. They were reading the scriptures and unpacking them in ways that were relevant to their lives. And in this place, they were getting to know God at a deeper and deeper level. Friends... That is the first layer of knowing. Um, they say that wisdom in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament is understanding. And, and part of understanding God is to be in relationship with God, to be engaged in God's word, to be engaged in a relationship of conversation, a prayer life, a meditative life. There are ways that the church is trying to model in the first century what it's like to continue to grow in our knowledge of God. Now, there's a second layer of, of knowledge that I think works. Now, this is more implied. It's not as direct in the text. But we read different places. I don't want to take anything away from the character or nature of God in God's self. But we read in the text in places like the Psalms and in other places that, that God already knows us, right? Um, I won't always remember the addresses, but the Psalter talks about how God was together with us when God knit us together in our mother's womb, how God knows the number of our days and the numbers of the hairs on our head, or the lack of number of hairs, um, that there is this knowledge that God has for us. And, and, and so you might say, Russell, how is it possible that you could actually grow in God's knowledge of you? Um, Anybody ever try to keep, I won't look, anybody ever try to keep anything from God? <laughs> the all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty, sovereign, Lord of Lord, host of hosts, and we in our infinite, oh wait, finite wisdom, I did that on purpose. We think it's infinite wisdom, but in our finite wisdom, we try to keep this from God. Whatever this is, 
God knows. So, so this second layer of, of allowing ourselves to be known by God is not something that we are revealing to God for the very first time. It's, it's the opening of our own hearts and presence to admit to God that we are fully known. So we are both knowing and being known by God in deeper ways. And that happens in relationship. It happens in our prayer life. It happens in our study life. It happens in a variety of ways. There's this third level of knowing that happens, and it is this interpersonal thing that happens more horizontally. As we spend time together, as we break bread together, as we have lunch together, as we um, commune together, as we worship together, as we play together, um, we get to know each other in deeper and deeper ways. Uh, let me assure you, there are some things that six or seven of you probably know that nobody else does about my family because you helped unpack my boxes. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. But it's the way that it works, right? I mean, there's going to be different levels of knowing um, but I think we're called to a depth of knowing that is really profound. Um, they met together daily. They were studying together. And as iron sharpens iron, they hear different experiences of, of people and their relationship with God. And, and we're nurtured in that way. But we also learn about one another's struggles. We also learn about one another's struggles. For me, there is no way that this group in the first century could have sold things as they needed to provide needs in the community if there wasn't a knowledge of what those needs were in the community to begin with. Does that make sense? I can only assume what you're going through if I don't know you. Oh, well, he's wrestling with his golf game, and she's wrestling with the budget, and I can make assumptions. But that's not knowing that's just contextualizing, and I may be really good at discerning or making some assumptions, but I'm never going to be as good as knowing. And we're called to this deeper place of this intimate knowledge of one another, and this probably scares us to death. If you're anything like me, it scares me to death. You know, this is those places where it's not just the corporate worship that we gather because we greet one another and we may say, how's your week? How's it going? We know that your kids are in this grade. We know that this is happening in your life, but we don't really know one another to some extent. So this call is to do life more deeply together. And I mean, friends, this is why grow groups are at the core of our ethos as a community church here at Parkway UMC. It's so important that in those smaller spaces, um, did you know that this is not new? The accidental founder of Methodism thought that this was a spectacular idea based on the scriptures. Um, let me clear that up. Wesley, John Wesley, you have heard that name before? You'll hear it again. He was not intentional about starting a new denomination, so I frequently refer to him as the accidental founder of Methodism because his desire was to create a movement of holiness, a movement of spiritual growth and depth within the Anglican church. He was not setting out to set people apart. He was just trying to deepen the spiritual life of the people that were gathered around him. Um, and they did it through class meetings through small groups where they would hold one another accountable, that there would be this vulnerability that when we ask how it's going, we don't get just some patent answer. How many times has this happened to you? I'm just, who can I see out here? All right, let me pick on Dave. Dave, how's your day? How are you doing? Great. You're great. Okay. Dave didn't fall for it. Let's try it over here. Kevin, how's your day? How are you doing? I'm hot. You're hot. It's a little toasty in here. Um, don't stand up in front of these lights. It gets worse. Um, I hear the word fine come from that response very frequently. Um, we're fine. We're good. We're great. Do you know what fine stands for? Freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. I'm fine. <laughs> but we use this patent answer that say we're fine, we're great, without ever getting vulnerable enough to share what's really going on in our hearts. 
And we saw another pastor on his blog this week talk about how, it's Marty, y'all know Marty, some of y'all do. How is it with your soul? That's the depth of knowledge that we want to be in, this horizontal connection. It's, it's the place where Wesley talks about in deep ways that we need to be accountable to one another. That when it's not okay, when I am freaked out, when I am insecure, when I am neurotic and emotional, I have relationships that are deep enough with you all that we can walk through that together in the name of Christ. It's a depth of knowledge of knowing others. And so, friends, some of that just takes time for us to sit back and listen, to actually be intentional about wanting to hear what the other person has to say. It is an investment of grace. It is an investment of selflessness that we give to the other person when we ask how they're doing and we give them an opportunity to truly respond or we ask how it is with their soul or what's really going on, right? Those types of relationships are hugely important. It's in those places that we find out that people have lost jobs, that people have been denied payment from their insurance on the medicine that costs them $1,000 a month. It is in those places that we find out that people are struggling with the dark night of the soul, those places where they can't seem to feel the presence of God anymore. It's in those places we get to learn that people wrestle with real things like depression, and they're not games, right? It's in those places that we get to know people at such a level that, that we're in a different spot on the journey then. It's in those places we can then start listening to the still, small voice of God and responding in ways that are amazing and, and holistic and helping people find wholeness in the name of Jesus in their lives. That's why that's so important. But friends, it is not a one-way street. I can't come to you and say, Decker, I just, I've got to know you, <laughs> but you don't know me. <laughs> Right? And we're good at this because we'll put our chairs in a circle and we'll face one another and, 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 and that's how we'll be physically postured. But really what we're doing is our hearts are turned away. It's okay if I want to enforce or encourage or adamantly um, exhort you to be vulnerable and open with me. But many of us don't want to take the risk sharing that vulnerability reciprocally. So, friends, we've got to take some risks in that regard. Um, sounds like really deep, hard, tough work, and it's not as hard as it sounds. It's really simple. It's just not really easy, right? It's easy to take the time over a cup of coffee or um, even at the water cooler during work and really listen to what's going on in somebody's life. It's easy in a lot of ways to kind of open ourselves up to what God has in store for us and, and look at what God's done in the text and what God is doing in our lives together. Uh, you want to know how you learn each other's testimonies, you begin to share them in ways that really can be profound and powerful. I'll tell you, um, there is a young woman that really had wrestled with a lot. She had gone through a tremendous amount in her life, um, nothing that any other human being should ever have to experience. And it's in the place of community that she was actually able to finally get freedom from some of her demons from the abuses that she had incurred, from the ways that she had been treated, from the image of self-worthlessness that she had of herself, um, those things happened in the context of community. And it took years. It takes time sometimes to build that level of trust and to hold it in a holy and sacred place um, and, and to respond to it, not with a knee-jerk reaction, but with prayer and discernment. Um, this young woman was in the midst of the small group that my wife lived in for the first 10 years of our relationship. And I watched her just blossom into a new creation, confident of who she was in Christ, confident of 
her own image, regardless of what the rest of the world said, confident that God was not against her, confident in ways that were just amazing, but it was the community of women gathered around her for a period of time, willing to dive deeper into the knowledge of God, dive deeper into the abandon of letting God know them, diving deeper into their knowledge of one another, and, and to the point that this vulnerability was just second nature. And in that place, in that sacred space, this knowing brought healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus. It's amazing what God can do in those places. How else are we going to know what the genuine needs are in the community around us? You might think that this text is just a text that we might ought to apply in the way that I've laid it out to Christians only. But friends, it's this text that really shapes how I feel about the way that we do even benevolence in the church. Um, How do we know what the real need is if we are not engaged in deep, vulnerable conversation with the people that are requesting the need? How can we better do God's best will in the situation in ways that are holy and honoring to God and actually bring health and wholeness and healing to the people that we encounter, sometimes three or four a day? Now, those are conversations that the staff and I are having that we're trying to unpack this in in a way that we want to know what the needs are, but sometimes discerning those needs can only happen relationally with a level of knowledge that helps get us to the truth. We may have to rethink how we do some of those things. It's not that we're not willing to give. It's not that we're not willing to reallocate possessions and goods. It's not any of that that is the problem. It's really wanting to be sure that we are doing it in the best way possible, the best ideology of stewardship and completeness and wholeness of God's desire for us. I read this text, and it sounds like a whole lot of work. It sounds like a whole lot of opportunity for growth, and it sounds like, man, if I'm not careful, I could legalize this and make this a checklist. And the pastor just said, if I'm not reading the scriptures, if I'm not meeting with people, if we're not sharing the creeds of the church, if we're not doing these things in these ways, I hear how we can mishear this, but, but friends, this is um, more about a way of life than it is a checklist. Here's the beauty. When we follow this way of life, when we live into this methodology of being the church to its fullest, the Lord adds to the numbers daily those who are being saved. Friends, church is not about church. It's not about us. It is about the kingdom of God and and us bringing this message to a world that is hurting and in need. It is about us making sure not that we're just growing for not growing for our own sake, but that we are growing to actually have the kingdom of God grow. That is a beautiful mark of fruitfulness when we're living as the church did in the first century. I want you to picture it this way. Somehow, at some place in our relationship with God, we start like this. We have our hands out. We don't know what to expect. We don't know exactly what we need. And all we can do is receive whatever drop of grace, whatever ounce of mercy, whatever word of wisdom, whatever piece of knowledge that we can get, all we can do is receive and keep it close. But as we journey with God over time, we begin to see that we open our arms up higher and higher to God. As we continue our knowledge of God, we begin to open our arms wider and wider and wider to all the awesome understanding and knowledge and wonderment that there is in being in that relationship. 
Our prayer life deepens. Our meditative life changes. The way that we relate to God and think about God no longer is a cosmic Santa Claus, but a holy provider providing all things that are necessary for our salvation. It's a beautiful thing that happens. We often hold ourselves close to the vest as well. We're holding it this close because I'm afraid to get to know you. Really, that's not even the whole truth. I am more afraid for you to get to know me. We hold our hearts and our personhood, our identities in Christ and, and the gift that we can be to one another right here. But as we take steps of vulnerability and we start to open our arms to one another, we begin to make it less about us and more about them. And we do this continuously until we can open our arms to a larger and larger group of people. You know the beauty of when this horizontal and vertical relationship are living at their prime? Is your life stands as a beacon of the cross. Because we were audacious enough to know and be known the holy of holies and the people that God calls his children.